Hi, and welcome to today's virtual program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Kelly Corrigan. I'm a New York Times bestselling author and the host of KQED's Exactly podcast. I am super pleased to be in conversation with Katherine Schwarzenegger Pratt, who is also a New York Times bestselling author, here to talk about her new book, The Gift of Forgiveness. Thanks for joining us from LA. Thank you for having me. Uh, Guys who are watching, you can ask questions at any time during this. Um, someone from the Commonwealth Club is going to pull them together for me and shoot them over when the time is right. The way to ask a question is if you're watching on YouTube, use chat. And if you're watching on Facebook, use comments. Okay. So I have 45 minutes where I get to ask you anything I want. And then we'll <laughs> open it up to everybody else for 15 minutes and then we'll have Grace. to wrap it up. Wonderful. Um, so this is the book, it's called The Gift of Forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And it's such a worthy and rewarding and self-reinforcing project to study forgiveness yeah. the way mm -hmm. you have. And as I was reading it, I was thinking about all the forgiveness that is required in the course of even just a very typical life, which you've met people in here who have had incredibly atypical experiences. But all of us over time have to forgive institutions and we have to give strength for forgive strangers and we have to forgive our closest relatives for trivial things and true tragedies. We have to forgive people who are deranged um, and who cause nearly unspeakable suffering in our lives. And so, but the book starts on a really familiar note. And as a former teenage girl and the now the mother of two teenage girls, <laughs> I will just flag for everyone that there is an intensity to women's friendships that can make betrayal Shakespearean. Yeah. So that's where the book begins. Will you tell us a little bit about the inciting event? Yeah. So, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me and thank you for doing this. This is really fun and a great and creative way to, um, to stay connected and do fun events like this while we're all sitting at home in quarantine. So yeah. Yeah. thank you. Um, I, I started the book telling a story about a, um, a falling out that I had with one of my best friends at the time. And um, just to kind of explain my reason for doing a deep dive into forgiveness in general, because uh, one of the most common questions I always get is why forgiveness? And that's such a crazy topic to want to tackle. And um, so I had a really big falling out with one of my close girlfriends that I think, as you were saying, uh, as someone who, went, it seems to be a big women's issue. I know that men also have falling outs with their friendships. Uh, but from what I've gathered with talking about this book, my prep for this book is that women really can relate to this topic of a falling out with a best friend, because I think a lot of us create these friendships when we're very young, that we look at as um, history friendships, and you kind of paint this picture for yourself of you know, going to college together and, you know, being in each other's weddings, having babies together, living on the same block and just being a part of each other's lives forever. And then when that doesn't go as planned or when something, you know, big happens, betrayal, um, whatever it is that causes the a rupture in a friendship, it can be a very traumatic event. And I, uh, I think with the 22 people stories that are in this book, uh, falling out with a friendship sounds so trivial and, and silly. Um, but when I was going through it, it felt uh, very, um, very real and very serious and, um, and really hard and required a huge amount of effort and also grief. And it was a very strange thing to, to go through. And I felt like I was really struggling with forgiveness and, I know that I had struggled with forgiveness before that, but it was really that falling out that sparked my interest in forgiveness because I realized that I didn't know what forgiveness meant to me in my life and how to practice it. And I hadn't really had any situation where I wanted so desperately to move on and to forgive. And I just did not know what it meant. And I think we you know, most of us learn what forgiveness is when we're very little and on the playground and it's very simple. And then we don't really address what it means when 
you're 15 or when you're 20 and 25 and 30 and, and as you get older and it changes and, uh, and I hadn't really taken a moment to figure out what it meant to me and also how I practiced it and had I even practiced it before. So I did a big deep dive into forgiveness really just out of, um, out of interest and curiosity on ways to help myself navigate my way through my forgiveness journey. And I, you know, I went to churches, I went to therapy, I, I talked to a lot of different people and I found that the most helpful uh, information came really from talking to other people about their forgiveness journeys and their struggles and um, some people who experienced forgiveness very easily and quickly, other people who struggled with it for a very long time. And um, I felt like using their nuggets of wisdom and um, and their stories and applying it to my own life was the most helpful. And it really dramatically helped me and inspired me in my forgiveness journey with um, with a former best friend. And so I wanted to put it in book format and uh, and that's kind of why I start the book off that way. Well, I definitely don't think it's trivial to have a falling out. Like, I think that like um, women's friendships can be like a cornerstone experience of a, of a lifetime. I mean, right. you know, I bet your mom would say, uh, and your grandma would have said yeah. that these women, um, you do get super attached. And then when there's a rupture, it can be um, insanely distracting. Like you yeah. can be looping. Like I always think about it as like the tape is looping and mm -hmm. I can't stop reliving the moment or thinking of different things I could have said or right. what it fantasizing about um, reuniting or ripping someone's head off or, you know, like all <laughs> the different emotions, like I play them out in my mind and it's, and our mind share is deeply limited. There is yeah. only, there are only so many things at any given moment that we can be devoted to. And so to have one of the pieces of the pie devoted to anger and frustration and reliving and um, reapproaching a single incident is to give up a lot of your energy and power and potential for productive work. Yeah. I mean, I really felt that, um, you know, uh, in this particular situation, I would be really upset about it, say I was over it. And then when I would run into the person, I would have a huge amount of anxiety and stress and um, I felt it in my body. And so it was really a desire to eliminate that from my life and from um, just my existence and the anxiety of, you know, like what's going to happen if we run into each other, what's going to happen if someone brings up, you know, the name. And it's just, I think that, um, you know, Consume. as women, yeah, it's, it can be, it, it's something that we can stay in for a very long time. And it can also be something where, you know, for me, I just felt like I did not want that to be part of my life anymore. And I, after a couple of years of it was just like, this is something that I need to fix. And, um, and that's, you know, why I wanted to dive Thank headfirst you. into forgiveness. <laughs> well, forgiveness like the word is kind of bandied about and we make our kids say we're sorry to one another. Right. You know, in, so early in life that mm -hmm. they don't even, it's, we're almost at the danger of making it flippant where it's like, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah. I said, I'm sorry. And it's like, right. that's not, you're not even close to the kind of depth that we're talking about. And so with real forgiveness, with it, it, the, the word, in my opinion, should only apply to, to something that is extremely difficult to grant. Mm -hmm. And so some of the people that you met with are just incredible. So I want to, there's 22 people in this book. It's yeah. a really wide range. It must have been so fascinating and like personally enlarging. I mean, your heart must have grown like, you know, you'll never be the same. You can't possibly be the same person. After no, taking definitely it. not. <laughs> which is so wonderful. Like what a great book project to do. Yeah. Um, but there were four, there's four that I want to talk about before okay. we have to, um, share the stage with everybody who's watching. Um, so one was Nadia. So Nadia Bowles Weber is a friend of mine. Uh, we've done a bunch of stuff together with the Nantucket project. Mm -hmm. And um, so tell everybody a little bit about Nadia and what you took away from talking to her. 
Right. So I, so just to backtrack a little bit, I interviewed 22 people for my book um, just because I, again, I found so much help and wisdom from talking to other people about their different journeys with forgiveness and, uh, and just learning and very quickly that what forgiveness means to you is something completely different than what it means to me. And that's okay. And makes the topic of forgiveness that much more interesting and exciting, but also that much more challenging and daunting. And I, uh, I loved being able to talk to different people to be able to see that some people are able to practice forgiveness in an instant very easily. And Mm -hmm. other people, it takes 30 years and some people it takes, you know, they never get to that place. And it's, uh, you know, something they deal with throughout their entire lives and to know that there's no timetable on it. And there's only your way of practicing forgiveness. There's not a right or wrong way. And, um, and that was really eye opening for me in this journey of talking to 22 people. And as you've said, uh, I definitely, my heart for sure grew in the process of talking to these 22 incredibly inspiring people. And, um, and I learned so much about myself and also, um, just being, so inspired and moved by all of these people's stories because all of them are so different. They're com- one is completely different than the next. And my, my goal with that was really to be able to have a book that someone could pick up, see themselves in one person's story or feel inspired to welcome forgiveness into their lives by one person's story. Um, and also to not feel alone in their journey with forgiveness and if I could accomplish that with one person, then this book will have served its purpose because, um, it's, it's always my goal to, to be able to create something that will help other people just as, as it helped me in my journey. So, uh, when I first started to dive into forgiveness, I was doing a ton of different research on forgiveness and reading, you know, hundreds of stories that were so amazing and coming up with a list of different people that I wanted to reach out to blindly. And that I reached out to all 22 of these people, not knowing any of them. And uh, they were so gracious to let me talk to them. And all of them wanted to be a part of this book because they wanted to help other people in their forgiveness journey, because they've been able to see what an impact forgiveness has had on their lives and the importance of spreading awareness around it and the message of forgiveness was really important to everybody. And, uh, when I was doing my research with forgiveness, my, uh, my mom actually sent me a video that Nadia Boltz Weber, uh, had created a couple years ago that was called, um, forgive a holes. I don't know if I can say that uh-huh. word on here, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I, I posted it recently cause her and I did an Instagram live but it's an incredible video. And the way my mom sent it to me because she knew I was doing all this research on forgiveness and, and for my book and also just interested in forgiveness. And it's a great video. And so I watched her video and the way that she talked about forgiveness changed everything for me. Um, she talked about forgiveness in a way that I had not been spoken to about forgiveness. And the way that she talked about it was that Forgiveness is a gift that you give yourself. It's not about giving somebody a gift of forgiveness. It's not about, you know, um, giving anybody anything or waiting for somebody to ask for something. It's about you as an individual saying what that person did or people um, was so wrong that you no longer want it to be a part of your life moving forward and to, you know, kind of shut your eyes and imagine yourself taking bolt cutters to the chains that are attached to you of, of wrongs from your past pains from your past and cutting yourself free of them. And that is what forgiveness is. It is giving yourself the gift that says you no longer want to drag those things with you in your life moving forward. And you want to free yourself from those pains from your past. And when I thought of it like that, it, for the first time I thought of forgiveness as being a really powerful and empowering Uh act and not as a 
weakness or as a act of telling someone it's okay what you did. I forget. It's okay. Like, I'm not going to think about it. Um, or giving somebody else a gift that they simply didn't deserve. And so I think for a lot of us, we grow up, uh, or I can speak for myself. I, I grew up thinking sometimes that forgiveness was something that a weak person does, or, you know, sometimes it felt like if I forgive someone, it feels like a betrayal of my own hurt. And why would I give someone a gift if they just hurt my feelings or hurt me really um, deeply? And so watching Nadia's video on forgiveness really changed the way that I viewed forgiveness and made it seem for the first time, like, wait a minute, forgiveness is about taking your power back and is about you deciding that you no longer want a situation or a person to control your life moving forward. And you're making that decision on your own. And, um, and so I reached out to Nadia blindly and I asked her if she could talk more about that and also her forgiveness journey, which, you know, she talks a huge amount about in, in general, in her life and in her presence, but she, um, talked about being an AA and, and her sobriety and the forgiveness that goes on in that process. And, um, and there are obviously a huge amount of people who deal with addicts in their family, um, addicts in life in general. And, and it was really interesting to hear her take on forgiveness. And, uh, and she was just such an inspiring and incredible person to, to talk and such to. an unusual messenger. So she's like 5'10", covered yeah. in tattoos, <laughs> giant belt buckle, blood red lipstick, gap between her teeth foul mouthed, so yes. articulate, <laughs> pull down quotes from like 14 different sources in a single sentence, yeah. like whip smart. Uh-huh. And so there's something about the way she expresses it that lets you hear it fresh, like it lets you hear it anew. But the thing that you just said that reminded me of the thing you put up front in the book, which was um, that this quote from Mark Nepo, mm-hmm. which this is what has kept me from forgiveness, the feeling that all I've been through will evaporate if I don't relive it. That if those who have hurt me don't see what they've done, my suffering will have been for nothing. Right. And what you're saying and what Nadia is saying is that the, you can um, set them aside, that the circle's much smaller. You're, you're in your own relationship with resentment and you're in your own relationship with forgiveness. And it may have very little in the end to do with the other person. Yeah. I mean, she also talks a lot about it's returning it to self. Yes, exactly. And she talks a lot about the story that we tell ourselves and sitting in that story and spinning Mm -hmm. in that story and, um, and reaching a point where you take accountability for whatever tiny little percentage you played or your part in a situation. And if it was absolutely no part, then that's okay as well. And, and just making the decision that you don't want to sit in that spiral anymore and that staying in it is not a healthy situation for yourself and also for your uh, desire to move forward. And so I think it's, um, she, she says it in a really approachable and, uh, and welcoming way, like a relatable way, because you feel like you're sitting there talking to a pastor, but also a very relatable and, yeah. <laughs> and, and interesting person. Kind of so. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it's interesting to me about that storytelling thing. I really related to that because in our house, you know, when you have little kids, you're always saying like, beware of absolutes. Like it's not always and never. Like I don't never let you have ice cream and I don't always side with your sister. Mm-hmm. And it's not everyone and no one. It's not everyone is going to the party or no one ever helps me with my work. And, but when you get when there's a wrong between two people and then they separate and they go into their corners and then they're just alone with their little unreliable narrator that they are. And they're telling their, they're spinning up the story of what happened without Mm -hmm. any incoming information from the other side now, because you've separated. And so you're, you're like hardening around this story of the way it happened and who that person is that is getting less and less nuanced and balanced with every day that you're investing alone in the creation and reinforcement of the story of how it went down. And that 
can be so unhealthy because then you reconnect with the person. I mean, I had this in my own life where you reconnect with the person who you'd been sort of stewing on from a distance and you think, oh, you're not that bad. I think I- <laughs> You're I like, why was I mad again? <laughs> yeah, like I, I mean, I know why I was mad, but like, you're not like a monster. Like I turned yeah. you into way more than- Yeah. But in some cases in the book, the, 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 I thought that the range of interviews you did was just so admirable and oh. brave. I mean, you must've been shaking in your boots in some of these because these are such- Tender moments. So will you talk a little bit about Scarlett Lewis, who was the mom from Sandy Hook? Yes. So um, Scarlett Lewis was uh, probably, I would say, one of the hardest interviews that I had done. And again, I, um, you know, I reached out blindly to all of these people. So I didn't know if they would want to talk about forgiveness. It's, you know, when you ask someone to talk about forgiveness, it's not the most exciting topic to talk about for most people. And it's oftentimes uh, very challenging and requires a huge amount of vulnerability and just being really raw and open. And um, Scarlett was a, an interview that I was really nervous for because I had read her story and her story is that she, um, you know, she lost her six year old son in the Sandy Hook shooting. And she, I did not know what to expect going into her interview. I'd read a little bit on her, but I, I just didn't know, you know, how much she'd be willing to share with me. And she was so incredible. And I think we ended up talking for two hours just because she, the way that she spoke about losing her son and, uh, and getting to a place, losing her son, having anger, having sadness, um, dealing with the loss of her son and also, you know, the devastation and having something taken from you very quickly. And of course, a young child, which makes it insanely terrible. And, um, and also having another son at home who was his older brother to try and balance that and also herself. And, um, and then I thought in the way you set up that scene of the older son looking at her and her feeling him watch her mm -hmm. and her maternal instinct that said, however I behave right now is gonna mark him forever. I am, I am modeling for him. He will never forget how I do this. So mm -hmm. if, I, if I live the rest of my days full of hatred and vitriol and, and the, the wrong that's been dealt us, so will he. And right. if I can somehow find a way to be bigger than that, so will he. Yeah. And I think that that just speaks, I mean, it was a beautiful moment that she talked about and she talks, you know, about having all of these feelings, which I think is really important of, you know, loss and sadness and anger and confusion and, and experiencing all of those. And then getting to a place where she felt empathy and compassion for the young boy who had taken her son's life. And when she spoke about that, um, it was a, it was a really, you know, incredible things for her to be talking about because to, to lose your son at such a young age to such a violent act, and then to have to get to a place of having empathy and compassion for the young boy who did that. And, you know, her whole mission is spreading the awareness and importance of social and emotional learning because of the message that, um, that her son Jesse left on their chalkboard as his final message, which was nurturing, healing, love. And she came to a place of realizing that if the young boy who took uh, her son's life had had nurturing, healing, love, he would not have gone to school with a gun that day and, and killed those children. And so she's dedicated her entire life to teaching children uh, about social emotional learning all across the world, all across the country. And she's such an inspiring and incredible woman. And she has really, um, her whole forgiveness journey and the way she speaks about forgiveness and having empathy and compassion, I think for majority of, of parents, they look at that and they just wonder how. I mean, it is so advanced. That is so mm -hmm. advanced in terms of like emotional, 
processing. And as you say, which I think is a really good note to underline for people listening, that um, forgiveness doesn't mean that you didn't feel and aren't feeling the mm-hmm. whole rainbow of emotions. Or They're won't ever feel it again. So, <laughs> so devastated, so um, heartbroken, so wronged, so angry, like all of that is not washed away. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's just something that you have to move past eventually, lest you live there forever. Like my, you know, my cousin Kathy's son was killed in a car accident when the summer after his freshman year in college. And she said, I, for 10 years, I said, why did that happen? And he Mm -hmm. wasn't driving. It was another kid. She was nervous about him going out. The woods were wet. They were going to a party. And then she finally got to like, it happened because it can, like a car can skid out on wet leaves and hit a tree and it can flip over and metal can pierce and glass can break. And this is not anybody's fault. Mm -hmm. And to get there as quickly as Scarlett Lewis did and to take all that energy and reshape it into something so positive and, um, and I think probably deeply effective, like what a great thing to do in, in, in a post Sandy Hook moment. You could either fight for gun control reform, God help us all if we ever get that passed, or you can address the underlying issue of who is this kid that did this and why and what did they need that they didn't get? And she says something in that chapter very quickly about, you know, who must he be? It says, um, I remember right off the bat, right off the bat, thinking that whoever could do something so horrendous must have been in a tremendous amount of pain. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's advanced. Very. Yeah. And I think it's also, you know, it's important to, to note that whatever the situation is that anybody is going through that, you know, that this is Scarlett's way of having dealt with her tragedy. And then there are other people who, you know, deal with it in their own way, or, you know, your cousin who took 10 years to get to a place of moving on past it. And that it's, it doesn't mean that once she practiced forgiveness or was able to forgive that she never had a, have had moments of trigger moments of feeling sadness or anger ever again, because she did but it was all about how you bring yourself back to getting to that place and that choice of forgiveness. Yeah. 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 That's a really good thing to add to the conversation so that people don't feel like failure, uh, forgiveness flops. Yeah. Like, you know, cause you could, <laughs> she's so amazed. There's so many people in this who are, feel so far beyond what I personally am capable of. Yeah. But it's, so it's very kind of you to remind us that well, it doesn't I, I lose, like to. You have to reapproach, and you have to like re recommit to the to the cause. Yeah, I like to also, you know, point out um, that the twenty two people in this book, their stories are, you know, incredibly inspiring and just remarkable stories of of forgiveness in all different forms, and some people who are still struggling with forgiveness. Um, my goal was my goal with this book is to inspire people to welcome forgiveness into their lives and also to learn from the 22 people in this book's uh, forgiveness journey to inspire you to welcome forgiveness into your life. It's never to compare each other's hurt because I don't think anything good comes from that. And that's never the goal of my book at all. And I don't think that it's a, a good habit to get in in general, just in life is, my hurt is worse than your hurt. Your hurt's worse than my hurt because everybody's hurt is their own hurt and it is the biggest thing in the world to them. And so it's never, uh, I, I never like when someone says, when someone comes to me and says like, oh my God, well, what they experienced was so much worse than what I experienced. And like, my thing is nothing. And I'm like, if you feel that way, that's, you know, okay. But also if you feel like, what they experience, what someone in this book experienced was so terrible and it inspires you to welcome forgiveness into your life. That's great. But also let yourself own the hurt that you experienced and that you have, uh, in your life because it's very real. And this is never to discredit the hurt that you've experienced. It's just to inspire you to see how 
forgiveness has changed these people's lives dramatically and also has had a ripple effect on changing other people around their lives. And, yeah. um, and, and will hopefully make the forgiveness journey for readers and, and people who are listening or reading uh, to look at forgiveness in a different way that could make their lives much more free from mm-hmm. carrying around anger. You know, it's interesting that thing about like um, tragedy comparing or like, oh, they have it so much worse or I have it so much worse or the kind of contest that sometimes people have. And I think about it right now with COVID mm-hmm. because I, I have, there, there's so many ways that you could be suffering right now. Mm-hmm. Like you could have a parent who has it. You could have someone in your family who has it. You could be far away from someone who has it. You could have just lost your job. Your husband could have just lost his job, et cetera, et cetera. And it's hard sometimes to feel comfortable saying like, I had such a shitty day. Like I was so down all day long and I don't have any of the problems I just listed. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's also, I think, very compassionate of you to make this note that like your feelings are your feelings mm-hmm. and there's really no sense in denying them. You might as well let them in, feel them out and keep moving. But there, there's no point in saying, um, well, that person has it so much worse. I don't know what, well, I don't know what I'm crying about. Yeah. Um, so the, the next person I wanted you to tell us about, you said that probably the most difficult story to take in was the story of Adele. Yeah. Tell everybody about her and what she had to forgive. Adele. Well, Adele's a man. Um, oh, and he, um, he is a, incredibly inspiring man that I actually met because he is friendly with my husband and, um, and I had met him one or two times and I had heard about his story, but I wanted to know more about it. And, uh, just out of curiosity. And then also he had, had said to somebody that he had forgiven. And so his, his story is an incredibly graphic and uh, gruesome story of um, of a crazy series of events and he he's had if you look if you read his story and just look at his life it's kind of one thing after another for Mm -hmm. him and one tragedy after another and he um, he's so inspiring the way that he speaks about his experience and looking back on a very challenging and and tragic times and having forgiveness in his heart for people who have wronged him. And I think that that's really inspiring because he is now in America and he has a career as a, as a fighter and he does that professionally and MMA fighter, right? Correct. Yeah. An MMA fighter. And he, just has such a big heart and, uh, and you could have, you could look at how he, the way that he could have gone, which is anger, rage, you know, just for losing so many people in his life. And he came to America and just, you know, made the most of his situation and the way that he, when I sat down and talked to him, he came over to our house and I sat down and talked to him and it was one of those conversations that I had where I went back and I'm, and I had to keep going back and I, I said, wait, so you really forgive, you really forgive them. How do you forgive them? I mean, you watched terrible things happen. Like his, his brother was, uh, was shot in the face and, and lost his eyesight and his nose. And he, I said, I, he said, I forgive them because I don't want anything to, I don't want to take on that anger. And I would, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with that negativity. And it was just such a, and he has so many more wild things that have happened to him that are in his section of the book, but he just spoke about forgiveness and what it meant to him growing up. And, you know, I I also have found culturally forgiveness to be really interesting as well. And he was another person that I talked to who, um, you know, spoke about the cultural differences with how you learn about forgiveness growing up and 
and that's also really interesting to me. And, um, and so he's somebody who's a bright light of just the biggest heart in the world and just has welcomed forgiveness into his life in order to be the person and the man that he is today. And, and he speaks about it so beautifully. So I really am really just lucky that he shared his story in my book. He's like a practitioner, like he's yes. a habitual <laughs> forgiver like yes. that. You know what I mean? I mean, unfortunately has so much to work through. Um, so the book ends on a father son story and it's Pablo Escobar's son. Yes. Sebastian Marroquin. So tell us about talking to him. So he was actually my final interview <laughs> and, um, and he was an incredible person to talk to because I, I did some research. I found him online. I reached out to him and he doesn't live in America. So gutsy of you. <laughs> it really my mom is. Always, my mom always said that the worst thing that can happen when you reach out to somebody is that they say no and you move on and everything is fine. Why is so I, yeah. <laughs> so I had that mentality when going into do this book because also it was the only way that, that the book would get done in the format that I had envisioned for it. So I, I think us in America, we, you know, we've watched shows on Pablo Escobar, we've read about him, we've learned about him. And, and to, you know, to talk to his son about, uh, about humanizing him and talking about him and what it was like to have him as a father was fascinating to me. And I, remember I emailed him and we went back and forth on times and he was traveling a little bit and he, uh, he's not actually allowed in America. And he, so he was in Colombia and I talked to him, not really again, knowing what to expect when, you know, you had a father like Pablo Escobar and knowing the amount of tragedy that his father had you know, caused in so many innocent people's lives and also the life that his father left for him and, um, and his mom and his other siblings. So it was, you know, it could have gone a lot of different angles and the way that he spoke about his father was it not only humanized the figure of Pablo Escobar for me as someone who has learned about him and watched shows about him, but it was the way he spoke about him was so beautiful in the way that he said, you know, I never questioned my father's love for me. My dad loved me. He, you know, loved our family. He protected our family. And to me, he was just my dad. And I know that what he talked about knowing that what he, his father was doing when he was younger, he knew that it was wrong and asked him to stop. Mm. Um, but he never had anger or rage at his father for putting him in the situations that he was in as a child, which is incredible. And he also said, um, I'm going to not say this exactly correct, but he, he talked about it not being his responsibility or his role to judge his father. And that that's only God's role. And that was really interesting to me because I think there are so many people and I found this with doing this book and just leading up to this book, a lot of people who have, you know, extremely complicated relationships with family members, parents, um, for a variety of different reasons. And the way he spoke about, you know, viewing his father as just his father was really beautiful and really interesting to me. And then to see what he's done with his life since losing his dad, which is that he has really dedicated his entire life and his entire being to going to all the victims of his father and asking for forgiveness on behalf of his father. Mm. And that to me, when he told me that he, you know, I know that he had done a documentary on his dad and that he, he talked a lot about this mission that he had for his life, but to take on the amount of, you know, amount of victims, families that he had, that his father had left here and to choose to make it your life mission to go to each family member uh, that was affected by his father's tragedies, which we know is a lot. Um, 
and to make that your goal to go to them and ask for forgiveness when he didn't need to do that at all. Cause that's his father's. Right. You know, right. Life. But he decided to do that. And I said to him, well, how many people have said that they forgive you? And he said, a hundred percent, all of them have said that they've forgiven me. And I was, I just remember thinking just like, oh my God, if this man is going to each person, which is such an incredible decision to be able to, to even want to do that as a young man. And then, you know, it's not like his dad's alive and he can go and say to his dad, you know, I, this person forgave you. He's just doing it in honor of his dad, but also to do right by, you know, all the people who were affected. And then also to change the vibe of Colombia yeah. and to welcome forgiveness into Colombia and talk about forgiveness in a place where that is not, had not been talked about. And, uh, and so I think he was such a fascinating person to talk to. And then you could tell just had a really beautiful heart and, uh, and an amazing young man, a hundred percent just. Yeah. Amazing. Well, it was an, a super strong finish to the book. I was thinking when I was reading it about, um, the law of Gachacha in Rwanda, like how they had, after the genocide, they had yes. 800,000 war crimes or something to process. And Paul Kagame, who was the president, um, came up with this way for people to process them in this law of Gachacha, which is like the law of the grass hill, where a person would, who was charged with perpetrating genocide, would say in front of a community, eyeball to eyeball, to the member of the family, I killed your sister, I killed your mother, I put their bodies here, I raped them, I, I was wrong, will you forgive me? Mm -hmm. And if they could do that, then, then the other person had a total option to say, no, I do not, I do not forgive you, or I do not forgive you yet. But if they were able to reach some kind of moment of forgiveness, it healed the whole community, they got a lesser sentence, like they still went to jail, but they, they, it, it reduced their jail time, um, and it created the potential for like a thriving community, which is what you're saying about Pablo Escobar's son is that he's creating the potential for Colombia to heal. Yeah. And it also, um, you know, it shows really beautifully and there are plenty of stories in, in my book that talk about how one person's choice to forgive or to dedicate their life to forgiveness or to talk about forgiveness the ripple effect that it has on people around them, whether it's, you know, a country or a small group of people or a family member or whatever it is that you never know what one person's act of forgiveness, how that can affect those around them. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of different examples in this book of one person making a decision to forgive and it changing not only the course of their lives and whoever the person was that was involved, but also the lives of so many people around them. And when you're talking about the Rwandan genocide, one of the people in, in the book that I uh, interviewed is Immaculate Ili Bagiza, and she was in the, her family was killed in the Rwandan genocide. And she talked about going to meet the person who was a family friend of hers who killed her whole family and telling him across the table that he forgave, that she forgave him. And, uh, and, and you, her story is incredible and so remarkable, but these are all examples of how someone's decision to forgive not only affects their life because it's a gift that they've given themselves, but it is also a gift that, you know, when they decide to give to themselves really does have a ripple effect on those around them. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a few questions um, from our online audience. James Driscoll asked, is forgiving family easier or harder? That's funny that, uh, not funny, but it's an interesting question because, so I have this Facebook uh, group that we started prior to the book coming out called Forgiveness Ambassadors. And it was really a, a Facebook group that we started just to kind of start the conversation around forgiveness ahead of the book coming out and see, you know, how people would talk about it and, and engage around the topic of forgiveness. and. 
I would say majority of the questions that have come up in that Facebook group and also just in general at book signings that I've done and just events that I've been able to talk to people at is forgiveness of family members and how hard that is not only because of your closeness to a family member and being hurt by a family member, but also because you can't, for a lot of people, necessarily eliminate them from your life and not have interactions with them ever again in order to heal and give yourself time to heal. Um, so I think, I think yes, forgiveness and is watching. Yeah, that's the other thing. Like in a family, if two people are mad at each other, right? Then the other people are like. Yeah. Which, which, yeah like, Who's going to fold first? Exactly. Yeah. And there's so much so, pressure to not blow up the harmony of a family. And Yeah. I think that like, obviously every single person's family forgiveness story is different and unique and uh, very complicated. Of course, the one thing that I'll say is a big topic that we've talked about in this Facebook group is just implementing boundaries, healthy boundaries where you can when it comes to your healing process and also, um, you know, understanding that if something, you know, happens in a relationship, accepting that maybe your relationship might not go back to what it was before. And if you choose to have the person in your life still as a regular person or regular figure, that you are okay with understanding that, you know, implementing new boundaries that protect you and your heart moving forward while they're so hard to do, especially with family, it's okay to do that. And it's oftentimes, uh, probably more realistic than thinking in your head, you can eliminate them from your life altogether. There are of course, a lot of people who don't speak to their family members and, you know, that's totally their choice. But I think for a lot of people, it's always the question of how am I supposed to have Thanksgiving or have holiday time or, you know, interact at family functions with somebody who has hurt me so deeply. And that's, um, I think that's a really tough thing to do. And obviously when you are close to the person as a family member or a close friend or whatever the situation is, I think that makes forgiveness and the forgiveness journey, obviously that much more complicated. Yeah. I mean, it takes, it's funny. There's another question here um, from Nicole du- Dewey's that says, if you have children, what would you want to teach them about forgiveness? And when I was listening to you, I was thinking about, you know, I'm a mom of two teenage girls and obviously everybody with families is just face to face with them nonstop right now. Yeah. And there, there is a, like, it, it does sort of take like leadership from somebody in a family to teach you that like there's a way to not roll over not set yourself up for more pain Mm -hmm. but decide to let go of something to decide to forgive something and still set boundaries and like as you say it's so complex that I wonder is your mom a good teacher in this area is your dad a good teacher it's like how did you learn to how did you learn to be forgiving and how what would you want to teach your kids you don't have kids yet do you no, I, I have a step. I have a stepson. Um, I do not have my own children yet. Um, but, um, but I love, I've always loved kids and having a stepson is like the most fun thing ever. Yeah. So, um, you know, just, I think having, when it comes to what I would teach my children about forgiveness, uh, I actually asked, I talked to Cora Jakes Coleman, who's in my book and she spoke a lot about how she's teaching her two young children about forgiveness at a very early age. And I, and she's talked about, you know, teaching her children the difference between saying, I'm sorry, versus I apologize. And the importance at a very early age um, for kids to be aware of the power of I apologize and being held accountable for their actions, acknowledging the hurt that they've caused and also, um, and making the decision to not want to cause that kind of hurt or pain again. And so I think that that's a really great way to teach young children about forgiveness. And then I think as kids get older or people get older, that seems to be where it seems like a more complicated, and I'm sure you deal with this with your teenagers, (laughs) that 
it seems to be that that's when forgiveness changes from being very simple and easy as a child to then right, like saying, you took my candy, who cares? Yeah. You, you or you like, didn't include me on the playground or whatever it is. And then, um, you know, when you get older and there are more emotions and, uh, and things involved and in history, forgiveness, the complexity of the history. Exactly. So I think just keeping the conversation open around forgiveness is what I intend on doing and and being able to just be open about what the definition of forgiveness changing, how we practice it, how we struggle with it, being really open about that. And I learned about forgiveness. You know, my mom is obviously an incredible teacher in all areas of life and with forgiveness as well. And she always you know, was really open with us for kids about, you know, you know, how she felt about certain things in, in life and knowing that how we were feeling was okay. How she feels is okay. How another kid's feeling is okay. And how everyone's feelings are valid and okay. And always also both of my parents created an environment for us kids at a very early age of just being really non-judgmental, And so I think that that allowed conversations like a conversation about forgiveness or curiosity around the topic of forgiveness to be something that we would feel comfortable talking to them about because we didn't feel judged or criticized about, you know, asking those kinds of questions or struggling with something or wanting to learn more. So I think that, you know, having that kind of environment is a blessing for teenagers and also just kids as we get older in general. And, uh, and I think my parents did a very good job at that. Yeah. My, my big thing around here is, um, talking about the difference between saying, I, I'm sorry. And I was wrong. Yeah. And I feel like saying I was wrong is like, so deeply humble. Like that is steeped in humility Totally, and it's so unequivocal. Yeah. And what I think is behind it, the, the healing that it, the potential for healing is that what I'm saying, if I say I was wrong, is that you and I actually agree. We have the same worldview. And in right. both of our worldviews, that kind of behavior is wrong. Mm-hmm. And I, I did it. I wish I didn't do it. And I agree with you that it was wrong. And right. agreement is so hard to come by sometimes in families. So yeah. anyway, let me get to a few more questions before... We have to go. Alyssa Broad said, what is the hardest thing you have had to overcome? How did you find forgiveness? Well, I think just, you know, probably I would say the falling out with my friend that I was talking about the beginning of this conversation and that I open with uh, talking about in my book is, was um, something that was really challenging that took me many years to get to a place where I eliminated that anxiety and nervousness and um, and frustration with myself in the process. And I think uh, one of the things that I also learned very quickly with doing this book and talking to 22 people is that there is no timetable on forgiveness. And that was really a relief for me to hear because I think so many of us we have something happen in our lives and we want to hurry up and forgive just to get over it and move past it and move on with our lives. And, um, and I was talking to Chris Williams earlier today, who's also in my book and has an incredible story. Yeah. And he said that when he was told the advice of being patient and that forgiveness takes patience, he did not like hearing it Mm -hmm. when he was told, but he now tells people that piece of advice because it's so true about forgiveness is that it's requires patience. It requires time. And, uh, and that can be really challenging for all of us. And I know that it was really challenging for me, whether it was, you know, with my friend or just in a variety of different situations in life, it's like, you want to speed up the process on just moving past something. And it's like, you know, you have to take your time and everyone's time is unique and, uh, and specific to their situation. And I think that's encouraging to people who feel like they've been stuck in a situation for a long time. Yeah. I think we have time for one more. Um, And it's kind of interesting. It's almost like a technical question, which is from Neil Grimmond. 
And it says, can you forgive someone and still cut them out of your life? How do you explain that complicated idea to the person you're cutting out? So I love this question because this is something that, um, that I had asked myself in my own life and then asked, it was a question that I actually asked a lot of the people that I interviewed for this book. And that was, if you, if you choose to cut someone out of your life and say that you forgave them, is that really forgiveness or is that eliminating someone from your life for convenience purposes and you still have resentment clearly towards them because you don't want them in your life any longer. And it was amazing to hear that every single person pretty much said that if you choose to cut someone out of your life, that doesn't mean that you haven't forgiven them. Bless you. It doesn't mean that you haven't forgiven them. It means that you don't, that you have forgiven them, but you don't want to have dinner with them and that's okay. And that to me was something that I myself was struggling with because when I was having this falling out with my, uh, with my friend, I, I oftentimes would think, well, if I forgave, if I have forgiven this person, then why can't I go to lunch with this person? Or why can't I go hang out with this person again? And and everybody told me that I talked to, you know, you can forgive someone and choose out of boundaries for yourself and to protect your own heart and to protect yourself moving forward. You can choose to not have them in your life now or ever again, and that's okay. It has nothing to do with your forgiveness journey. It's all about how you choose to protect yourself moving forward. And um, so to answer the question, if... <laughs> If uh, you choose to forgive someone and to cut them out of your life, that does not mean that you have not forgiven them or done the work to forgive them. It means that you have probably forgiven them, but you also want to be mindful of your boundaries and your heart and your life moving forward and, off, and also protecting yourself so maybe that same pattern doesn't happen again. Yeah. And that was a big relief for me to hear because... Um, I think we all know when we've forgiven someone a little bit, like, and, and even if we think that we've forgiven them and then we hear the person's name or we might run into the person accidentally and we still have that anxiety feeling, then we realize like, maybe I should go back and practice forgiveness a little bit more yeah. and then I'm not totally done there. And that takes time. But I think that it's totally, you know, your call and okay to, choose to not have someone in your life any longer in order to protect yourself moving forward. Yeah, I really agree. Um, okay, it is an informed tradition to ask all our speakers the following question. What is your 60 second idea to change the world? Right now, my 60 second right idea now, would seconds. be for everybody to stay home. That's like that, my, that is the my right. biggest. <laughs> That's my, that's, it's not my idea, but I would say that, uh, we can see how much of an impact everybody staying home right now is, is making on this whole spread of coronavirus. And while it is incredibly challenging for so many people, and obviously there are a huge amount of people who cannot stay home and that are working at grocery stores and in emergency rooms and in hospitals to keep us all safe, that we're staying home so everybody can do their job and, um, and put an end to the spread of this crazy virus as quickly as possible. And it's for safety. And so my advice for a better world is stay home. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so Very much. Forum at the Commonwealth Club. Copies of Catherine's book are available for purchase at your local independent bookstore or barnesandnoble.com. If you'd like to watch more virtual programming, or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit informsf.org slash give. I'm Kelly Corrigan. Thank you and good night. Bye guys. Thanks for coming. Bye.